Thank you, Holling, for that reading and for your study this evening. Tonight we're going to be continuing uh, with another hard saying of Jesus. And as we begin, I want you to imagine with me for just a moment. Imagine that uh, you've come to the end of, of this life and Judgment Day has passed and you are in heaven. You see many loved ones there that have passed on before you. You're reunited with them. You're acquainted with heroes of faith like Moses and Abraham. And of course, you see Jesus, your Lord. And the realization hits you that you will forever be in the presence of God and what a glorious thing that is to you. And without a second thought, you cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And among all of these souls, every last one of them is joining and bowing and praising God, casting their crowns before his feet. But among all of those souls, you see the one there who on earth was your spouse. But, but things are noticeably different. You notice that the, the ring finger on their left hand, the, the ring that you placed there one day, it's not there anymore. You take a closer look at their appearance and it's a little bit altered from what you remember here on earth. It turns out now that they have a new name engraved on a white stone that the Lord Jesus gave them that only they now know. And then the word of the Lord rings loud in your ears as it speaks. The sons of this new age are neither married nor are they given in marriage. That's a concept that is kind of distressing to many people, to many Christians, when they read the text that Holling just read for us a moment ago. It is a very hard saying that Jesus said here that the sons in the new resurrection, in that new age, they are neither married nor given in marriage. It's a very confusing passage, and we're going to take some time to look at that this evening. It can be easy to understand. I mean, what he said was pretty cut and dry, but it's very hard to accept, if you will. But we're going to talk about it this evening. But first, I want to understand what prompted Jesus to even say these words in the first place. Well, he was approached by a group called the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were a religious group that only counted the law as scripture, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Acts 23, verse 8 tells us, For Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So the Sadducees were, they were quite uh, limited uh, or they hindered themselves from having a true understanding of, of the kingdom of heaven, the nature thereof. They, their knowledge of the Messiah was pretty limited. They didn't believe in a resurrection, no angels, no spirits, nothing like that. They were, they were pretty limited in their belief system. But they posed a question based off of Deuteronomy, a passage in their law. Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, which basically is a law that describes the idea of of a man and a woman are married, the man dies without having had children with his wife before he passed, and that woman is supposed to then marry his brother, if he has one, and they are to together raise children for the deceased husband to keep his name alive um, there in Israel at that time. And so the Sadducees pose this scenario to Jesus. They say, Jesus, there was a man, he had seven brothers, or seven brothers total, so a man with six brothers, and he marries a wife, they're married, but they don't have kids, and he passes away. And so, as the law says, she marries his brother, the next in line. Well, he passes away before they can have children. And she does this with all seven of the brothers. She's married to them, but they all pass away before they can have children together. And so, their question that they pose to Jesus in Luke 20 and verse 33 says, Therefore, in the resurrection, which they didn't believe in, Whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as wife. Now, it's a fair question, I suppose. But it's also, I don't know, I, I can't help but get kind of a, a silly image in my mind, you know, on Judgment Day comes and the Lord returns and all his angels with him and the graves are opened and this woman is like, wait, well, what about him? Well, I was married to him. Oh, wait, I got to go into heaven with him. I mean, it sounds kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? doesn't it? But Jesus answers this question in, in a very, very interesting way. He says there, Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age, this age, 
marry and are given in marriage. Okay, that's pretty cut and dry. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore. For they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. So Jesus tells a lot of truths here. Many of them uh, are pretty easy to understand. For example, he's talking about two different ages. This age and that age. This age is what it means, this age that we're living in now, today. It's the physical realm of earth, this age, today. But that age, he says, that's what takes place during or after the resurrection, right? That's, that's the eternal age, the spiritual age, if you will. So he says there are those who are counted worthy to attain that age, implying that only the worthy get to gain the benefits of that age, whatever those might be. He implies that there is a resurrection, which the Sadducees didn't believe. I think many of us here probably do believe there is a resurrection. He says that there's not going to be death, nor can they die anymore. Right, the place where we're going in eternity, there's no death there. I think we understand that pretty clearly. He talks about that they, those who are worthy to attain that age, they are equal to angels. They're sons of God. There's kind of this exalted status or a change, if you will, from what we are now as, as physical human beings to becoming something like or equal to angels, immortal. You become heavenly heirs in God as his children. And all that kind of makes sense. You know, okay, we got to, you know, we have to be counted worthy. We have to be faithful and obedient to God, have to do right in this life, right? One day when... when Christ returns, the graves will be opened, we'll be resurrected, we'll go somewhere where there's no more dying. We, we kind of understand these concepts. But there's that one phrase there, neither marry nor are given in marriage. And that's the one that just kind of, just, just feels off, doesn't it? It kind of rubs, rubs you the wrong way. I was doing some research and preparation for this study and even talking to some folks, some from here and some from elsewhere, about this passage and that concept you know, in the resurrection, the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. I'm trying to get some perspective on, you know, what other people think of that. And I got a, a lot of different answers. Some folks are, are quite at peace with that. Others are a little bit troubled and worried, but know that heaven is a place where there's no tears and, and no sorrow or no death. So it can't be a bad thing, therefore, if that's the case. You know, and others, I, I read one article in particular. A woman sounded like she was quite young when she lost her husband. They had young children still living at home. And she expressed her grief in that and, and even said, you know, like, well, well did, did my marriage even, did it matter? Did it even matter? Because now he's gone, and, you know, in that age that we're all supposed to be striving for, if we're not going to be married, you know, well, well, did it even matter? And... You know, I kind of thought that was peculiar. But honestly, you know, as, as a, a chronically single person, I can kind of relate to that a little bit, you know. If marriage isn't going to matter there, well, why should I put in the effort here, right? Well, there's actually a lot of reasons why it is important, why it is a good thing. We'll talk about that this evening. You know, some may want to take the, the Paul approach. In 1 Corinthians 7, you know, he said, I wish... All would remain as I am, implying be single, right? There's certainly a place for that. Many live that life, and it's a life to God, and God bless those that do so. But looking at the context of what Paul said there, and in the context of Jesus' thoughts here and elsewhere, you know, marriage is something that is a good thing, and it's a necessary thing here in this age, as he says. Romans 7 and 2, I want to make a observation from this as it relates to our thoughts this evening. Romans 7, beginning of verse 2, Paul is using marriage as an illustration um, for, for the Christians there in Rome that had come from Judaism and, you know, trying to make the point that they are no longer under the old law and don't need 
uh, that old covenant anymore because they're under the law of Christ now. But he says, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So a few observations. The covenant that establishes a marriage, that covenant becomes void at the point of death of either one or both spouses. Right? At that point, the marriage is done. Part of that covenant is till death do us part. And that implies that once death takes place for one or both spouses, then the marriage is done. It's been fulfilled. Right? And both the man and the woman have, have done their part, assuming that they've done it their part. They've done their due diligence to keep the covenant up to that point. And now, if either of them is still living at that point, that one is released from that, like Paul says. But also it's important to note that Christ is saying, or Paul is saying Christ frees us. And we become essentially, if you will, married or joined to him in order to bear fruit to God, right? That's our ultimate goal. That's the perspective that we're supposed to have in this life. Marriage is certainly a wonderful goal and should be a goal of, of, of many that need that. But the ultimate goal is to understand our relationship to God and to Christ and to understand that that we're to bear fruit, whether that's single or married, right? We all have that job. You know, there's an idea that maybe marriage, I don't know, I'll, I'll say it this way. Let me rephrase this. There's times where I've kind of viewed marriage or the idea of even finding a wife as, as perhaps maybe turn that into idolatry a little bit too much, if you know what I mean. And the truth is, Jesus, you know, he never said, husbands are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through husbands. King David never said, the joy of Abigail is my strength, Abigail is my strength and song. And the reason for that is not because either of them are trying to downplay the importance of marriage, it's because they had the proper perspective and understood what their goal in life really was, what the end goal looked like for them. I want to give you an example of what we're talking about here. In Ezekiel 24, this is a text that, there's not many texts that make me get mad at God, but this is one of those that I've always read it and just gotten frustrated with God, and I could never figure out why. I think it's because I didn't understand it fully, or understand some concepts, but read it with me, if you will. This is Ezekiel narrating the text here. He says, also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from you the desire of your eyes with one stroke, yet you shall neither mourn nor weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh in silence, make no mourning for the dead. Bind your turban on your head and put your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your lips and do not eat man's bread of sorrow. So I spoke to the people in the morning and at evening my wife died. And the next morning I did as I was commanded. I've always thought that this is just, it seems like a cruel act. You know, think about Ezekiel. He, he was a man, a prophet of God. He was faithful to God, obedient to God. You read the book of Ezekiel, we've got 23 and a half chapters up to this point of his life. And he always served God. He always obeyed God. God comes down to Ezekiel. He says that same phrase, son of man. That's how he addresses him throughout the whole book. Son of man, do this. Son of man, go to this. Son of man, say this to these people. Right? There was an instance even where God told him, you're going to tie yourself up to the ground he said, you're going to eat bread. Initially, he said, you're going to eat it cooked on human waste. Ezekiel said, can we not do that? And he said, well, you can do it on cow dung instead. Like, that's really any better. 
And Ezekiel did. He did that. He, he always obeyed God from what we see in his life. He put God first, no matter the cost. And you know, I'm sure Ezekiel was probably a good husband. If he was anything to her that he was to God, he was probably a good man to her, a good husband. And you know, she was probably a good wife to him, for him to, to be this, this kind of man that he was, such a strong man. But God ripped her out of his life, just right out from under him. And if the words of Christ that we're talking about tonight are true, then when that happened, they're, they're not married anymore, and they're done. And I just thought, that is so cruel. It seems so cruel. That's, that's a hard thing to, to digest. And also, th this was the time when, when God had caused Ezekiel's tongue to cling to his mouth so that he couldn't speak unless God allowed him to go prophesy, which means there was no, I love you, honey. I'm sorry, honey. It's going to be okay, honey. There was none of that. Ezekiel didn't get to say anything. All he could do is what he, he wrote here. The next morning, I did as I was commanded. Man. That's always kind of puzzled me. Been somewhat aggravating to me. But I think in studying for this lesson tonight and understanding what Jesus is trying to get us to understand is that proper perspective. For one, it's not man who joins together or, or separates. It's not our right to do so. Jesus, Jesus said that in Matthew 19, 4 through 6, in the context of divorce, he says, what well, God has joined together, let not man separate. Right? It's not, it's not our right or our privilege to, to separate what God has joined together which also implies that it is God that joins together. And if he so chooses, he can separate. But the more I thought about it, you know, now, now Ezekiel and his wife now are both long gone. And there's going to be a resurrection one day. And I imagine they'll both be a part of that. I mean, everything Ezekiel, the way he lived and all, all the things he did for God, Sounds like he'd probably be counted worthy, I would be willing to imagine. And so they're going to attain to that new age. And I don't think they're going to get there and think, you know, if, only, if only I had just told God no that day. And if only I had just stuck up for myself. If only God didn't take, her, take you away from me that day. I think they're going to be rejoicing. I think, I think they're going to understand or see their purpose in this life is going to be realized in the next. You know, marriage was an excuse used, Jesus, in the parable of the Great Supper, one of the excuses that angered the, the head man that threw this feast for the people was, I've married a wife and therefore I can't come. Sorry, Jesus, got better things to do. Ephesians 5 and 30, I think, really hammers at home what the proper perspective that we should have about our marriages. After Paul's got done talking about the roles of, of wives and husbands, he says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So the marriages that we have in this life, Ezekiel's marriage to his wife, your marriage tonight, if you're married, it's not a vain thing. It's not a bad thing. It's not a wrong thing. It's a very good and a very beautiful thing. It is a godly thing that you are married. But what that marriage should indicate to us, it should help give us a better grasp of the relationship the Lord has with us as the church and understand how important that is, the kind of love that he has for us and that we are to submit to that love 
and leadership that he has. So while, you know, there may, there may come a time where, you know, a spouse passes away or, or for some reason, you know, it doesn't work out for whatever reason, well, as was the case with Ezekiel, what better place for them to go than into the hands of the living God for an eternity? Now, Jesus, in the context of some of the things he's talking about, he makes some pretty clear points as to why in the resurrection it's going to be this way. First, he says, you know, neither marry nor are given in marriage. He says, nor can they die anymore. Right? So, in the resurrection, in that age to come, there's no more death. Well, in this life, not to be too morbid, but we're all dying, right? I mean, I'm, I'm dying as I speak. We're all, we're all going to go to the grave someday. And so procreation is necessary now in this age because of death. God told Adam and Eve, the first married couple, he told them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, right? You've got to build a family, have children, expand. In Revelation 21 and 4, in John's vision there of, of the new Jerusalem, he says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. John all but confirms that in that age, there, there's no more tears to be shed. There's no more pain there where we're going. Right? So, I know, I know this concept Jesus is talking about may be a little confusing and maybe even a little gut-wrenching, but, but trust the words here that where you're going, where your spouse is going, if you are living a godly life, there's no tears for either of you in that place. God's going to take that pain away. And you're not going to be there to die again. You're there to live together with the saints. He mentions there the idea of those becoming equal to the angels or sons of God and are sons of the resurrection. I think he says there, well, he says for, nor can they die anymore or, or because they are equal to the angels. That's why. Because angels don't die. They're immortal creatures created by God. So we become equal to them in that sense, that we are immortal. We become, as, as the Apostle Peter states in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, I believe, uh, partakers of the divine nature. That idea there, as Jesus says, our sons of God, we are his children or his heirs, partakers of the divine nature, his divine nature. Right here, we don't have that fully realized yet. Because we're human, we still make mistakes. We're still going to die one day. But there, right, that's all done away with. We become perfected in the resurrection. Being sons of the resurrection, he says, as in the idea that the resurrection births or brings forth this changed offspring, if you will. We, ha we have to be changed into this better creature. And there at the end... He says, for all live to him, to God. You know, I thought about the idea that, that many people in this life, we need companionship, right? Life is hard to go through alone. It's not always fun to go through alone. And God himself said, it is not good that man should be alone. Right? That's why he made Eve, because Adam needed her as much as she needed him. Right? They needed each other. It's not because God wasn't enough or God wasn't perfect or anything like that. But he himself knew that in this age, in order for them to be the most productive and to bear, fully bear his image and be, be, I guess, maybe happier and just more fulfilled, that they needed one another. And, you know, I think that may be one of the biggest hang-ups with this passage of, you know, how, how can in heaven, if there's no marriage, like, how, how can that be a good thing? Well, I think it's because that role of companionship is taken up by the Lord. 
In 1 Thessalonians 4.17, Paul is talking about the resurrection. And then he says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, the resurrected, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Right? Where we're going, we're not going to be lonely. Where we're going, we're going to have the best companionship that you've ever experienced in Christ, in the Lord. Now, in order to do so, he talks about you know, being counted worthy, and, and not, you know, I suppose there's some things you can imply with that about how you live. Certainly, that's, that's important. But I think it's also important to notice that we aren't going to go there the way we are here, right? Another reason why this text can be confusing is because we're reading it with physical eyes and our physical minds, and it's a little hard to grasp some of these things. But we're going to be changed. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So the way we are now, it's not, I guess you could say it's not fit for heaven. All right, because I, I mean, my physical self is, is broken in many ways. It's not perfect by any means. Now, sure, the way we, if you will, kickstart this is putting on the Lord in baptism, you know, being washed clean, being made a new creature, as 1 Corinthians talks about, right? It, it's kind of that idea of, of the washing of regeneration and there in Titus 3, right? That, that kind of starts this, but ultimately at death, right, before or when we are raised, there's going to have to be a change. Now, what exactly that's going to look like or feel like or what that experience is going to be like, I, I can't tell you. I've, I've not died and been resurrected and gone to heaven before. <laughs> if, if you have, let me know. But when we are raised, we'll be raised incorruptible. We'll be raised immortal, right? Made like the angels, he says. Becoming a better, more perfect being fit for the kingdom of heaven. And so what I want you to understand, part of the takeaway is don't think for a moment that the efforts that go into your marriage or your future marriage, that those aren't, are wasted by any means, because they're not. Again, you are married. If you are married tonight, it is because God has joined you together with your spouse. And that is a gift and a blessing. And that's not a waste of time by any means. If it's done so in the Lord, with him at the center of your relationship, that is by all means a beautiful thing. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, a few verses later, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And there's many ways as Christians that we can labor and work in the Lord. One of those being, I believe, your marriage. There's many things that we have to work out in marriage. You know, sometimes it's not perfect. Sometimes it's not good. And mistakes happen because, again, we're human. We're living in this age, in the flesh and blood age, and we're not immortal yet. We're not incorruptible yet. We have flaws. But constantly working, always abounding, knowing that those labors are not in vain, if they're done in the Lord. Now, all these things, again, are leading us to eternity. Perspective that your marriage should give you in this life should be that of eternity. Because in the resurrection and in that age, while the sons of man are neither married nor given in marriage, per se, like it is here, there is an eternal marriage that we will be celebrating there. 
In Revelation 19, verse 6, John says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. This marriage in eternity, as big of a blessing as marriage in this age is, the marriage of the Lamb with his wife, the church, is going to be the most incredible marriage the universe has ever seen. He says, blessed are those who are called to that marriage. And as the church, that's you and me. I want you to understand that. As the church, you have been invited to this, and you are blessed because of, because of that. Understand that. I don't usually do stuff like this, but there are some many married couples sitting here tonight. If you are not already doing so, take the hand of your spouse sitting next to you and hold it firm and don't let go. And read this verse with me. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, you are holding the hand of the most beautiful person in your life. And it is your God-given duty to love, love them, to cherish them, to protect them at all costs. It is your God-given duty to, if you must, give your life for that person, that hand that you're holding. And wives, when you hold his hand, perhaps you feel a sense of strength and comfort and safety some peace, and it is your God-given duty to love, love him, to help him through this life, to submit to that hand, and to be a companion to him. Now, understand that both of you are together joint heirs of this age to come, both of you. And it should be everyone's goal, whether single, whether married, single and going to get married, whatever it looks like, it should be your goal first to follow God and to ensure that you are a part of this marriage supper of the Lamb. And as you enter into marriage, it is your goal and your responsibility to see to it that they also get in with you. John 10, verse 28 Jesus, speaking of his people, says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Husbands, it is your job to see to it that you get that hand placed into the hand of the Lord for eternity. And wives, it is your job to make sure that you get that hand placed into the Lord's for all of eternity. As God's creation, it is rightfully His to have. And take comfort in that, knowing that nobody is going to snatch them out of His hand. There they will be loved, there they will be protected, there they will be cherished for an eternity in ways that neither of you will ever experience in this life here. Satan himself will not snatch them out of his hand. There is an eternal marriage. It is the church with Christ. And so I ask you this evening, will you be a part of it? And perhaps more importantly, will they be a part of it? 
I want you to think about that as you go throughout your life. This evening, if there's anyone here that has a need, if you would like to become a child of God, be joined to the church, and receive that invitation, take up that invitation to the marriage supper, why don't you do so? We have the waters ready this evening, and we'll help you with that. And if you are a Christian but feel that you are struggling with whatever it may be, any issue at all, and you'd like to make that known, have, have us pray for you, whatever it may be, we invite you in either case to please come and join us at the front as we stand and sing.